Okay, so uh, welcome you once again to the IES 36 impairment of assets. Uh, let's look at that every aspect of the standard and let's go into it. So it's about IES 36 impairment of assets. How do we impair assets? As usual, we should go through the issues. Here yeah, we can have issues like one, the objective and scope of this standard and scope of this standard. You can also have the recognition criteria of this standard recognition criteria of this standard. You can also have what you call some terms. In fact, I normally place the terms as second. So let me put that in here too. So some terms stated in the standard. So some terms that we need to grab and get them. So terms and go to recognition. We go to measurements. How do we measure that of impairment? Then five, normally talks about disclosure. But here we have other issues that we need to talk about. Six, uh, in fact, that one should be in there before the disclosure. So let me talk about recognition. And then the reverse, reverse of impairment. At what point in time can we reverse all impairment charge? The standard prescribe a criteria or certain measure that the entity should go in before they can do what reverse all impairment. And then we will look at it reversing impairment for goodwill. So, and for car generating unit and for individual assets. So, that is the reverse. And then the kind of critical risk. Good. So, let's go straight and then look at the impairment assets. First of all, the objective of this standard procedure is to prescribe the correct accounting treatment of impairment losses. How we should treat impairment, how we should even determine and calculate impairment in the books. So that is the objective of the IS36. We should take notice of that main objective of IS36. So the objective of this standard as usual to prescribe the procedure that an entity applies to ensure that its assets are carried at no more than their recoverable amount. It means that the assets are like if properly accounted for any impairment. That is the meaning of, or that is the main objective of the. IES 36. Means that the IES 36 will make sure that the entity carries its assets or the current amount of the asset of the of the entity not more than the recoverable amount. We will go into detail. Okay. Now let's look at the scope. Scope of IS 36, like the scope talks about the coverage. Now, you know, uh, there are some impairments where that one, other standard talks about it. So, those ones, we are not going to cover them in IS or under IS 36. Let's take note of that. For instance, this standard applies to all impairments. Payment of all assets other than the following assets. So let's look at the exclusion of these assets. Like exclusion from 
this standard. We can, or this standard apply to impairment of all assets, with except on some specific asset that IS exists that not cover. Critically, you can give an example like inventory. Impairment of inventory is not being accounted for under IS 36. It's been accounted for IS 2 inventory. We call it inventory written down. Anytime you write off part of your inventory, we call it implicit impairment. Good. And that one, if you do some impairment, inventory need to be impaired, we are not going to use IS 36 to account for such impairment. We still have to measure it within the IS to event. Great. So impairment of or uh, written down of the following assets uh, does not fall under the scope of IAS 36. So the following assets, so say that this standard apply to all assets. So this standard apply to all assets except the following. So except Except the following number one, that examiner inventories. So, inventories that IAS2 is not part, written down of inventory is not part of the IAS36 scope. And then, contract assets, contract assets arising from, let's say, cost to obtain or fulfill a contract. So that is construction contracts. Construction contracts and the IFRS 15 revenue. So know that. So contract assets. Contract assets. That is under IFRS 15 revenue. IFRS 15 talks about revenue. And then Number three, it does not apply to defect tax assets. Defect tax assets. Defect tax assets. That is IAS 12 income taxes. IAS 12, IAS 12 income taxes. Check note. Again, this standard does not apply to Asset arising from employee benefits. So assets arising from where? Employee benefits. So assets arising from employee benefits. So employee benefits. Employee benefit is IAS what? 19. Thank you. That is employee benefits. So any asset arising from there, we cannot use um, impairment to count for it. Then uh, five, we can talk about financial assets within the scope of IFRS 9, financial instrument. So number five is financial world. Five is financial instruments or financial assets. A particular example of financial instruments is the financial asset or a type. Okay, so that is financial asset. Let me clean the top, adding more to it so that you know the scope of impairments. So let me write number five here financial assets, financial assets. That is IFRS 9, financial instruments, IFRS 9. Number six, we will also look at for exception number six is investment property. Investment word property in the market and the fair value model. Thank you. Just be specific, health and the fair value model. That's IES about 40. Health and the fair value model, IES 40. So take note, any investment property held and a fair value model, 
uh, will not impair or any written down will not be accounted for under impairment. Not that we are not going to impair it to. Here, any written down will not be accounted for as if it is impairment loss. It will come with a different treatment. For instance, investment property and fair value. If the value drops, if the recoverable amount drops, which suggests there's an impairment, then it means that we need to just account for it as revaluation or fair value loss on investment property in our profit and loss. Any gain that will arise after the loss will not be reversed. That is all. I'll talk about asset number six. Sorry, number seven. That is biological assets. So biological assets. Biological assets. Biological assets. Or related to agriculture. That's IS41, right? Okay. And then insurance contracts. Insurance contracts. So number eight, insurance contract. That's IFRS 17 and IFRS 4. Then the non-current assets classified for or classified as what health for sale. So health for sale, we don't impair. Or any written down value will not be accounted for as impairment. Yeah, then. Okay, so basically these are some few uh, exception to that of the impairment. So take note. The ninth one is what non-current asset held sale or disposal. That is IFRS or five. IFRS five. So take note. So these are the exceptions. Not that those ones don't have written down, they do. But uh, what happens is this. They are written down will not be treated as impairments, that's the part. Inventory have a written down. But written down of inventory is not an impairment. You are not going to treat it as an impairment, even though we sometimes call it implicit impairment. That is all. So now we are done with that of the The scope. Then there are some terms that they've defined in there. Those ones, I don't normally define them upfront. So I wait. You are going to use each of them at each point. So when the need arises, we will probably explain them. We will explain them. So we can go straight to identify an asset that may be impaired. Let's start with the main issue. We are just moving around. So let's go straight to the point. Impairment. Impairment. So what is impairment? Now, impairment moves like this. Anytime you have an asset and you suspect that mm, this asset I may not be able to generate or I'm not be able to recover the current value, mm, then that means that asset may have been impaired. So impairment exists if and only if, if and only if one, the current amount of the asset, the current amount of the asset exceeds exceeds what the recoverable amount recoverable amount so take note impairment exists if the current amount that is the current value of the assets cannot be recovered it exceeds so for instance you have an asset the current value that is cost minus accumulated depreciation. You had, let's say, a cost of 1,000, depreciation of 200, 
giving us a current value of what? 800, right? A current value of 800 versus the recoverable amount. Let's assume the recoverable amount is, let's say, $600 or cents. What happened is this. So that means you have an asset. You suspect that you might not be able to get the value, the current value of the asset. You suspect that the value will probably drop. So anytime you suspect that you may not be able to get the actual value of the asset, then there is an indication that this asset might be impaired. That is all. An impairment exists if and only if the current value exceeds the recoverable amount. So therefore, we define impairment as this. Impairment is an amount or as an excess of current amount over the recoverable amount. So that is the definition for impairment. How do you get it? Good. So impairment exists or impairment as it's if the current amount is the recoverable amount, that's all. So we are saying that an asset is impaired when its current amount exceeds its recoverable amount. That is all. That is the that is the point that we need to get it. Okay, so that is all. Now let's do something in here. Let's go into detail. Let's look at something in here. Let's assume that we have a current amount of, let's say, C. Chapter accountants come again and current amount to, of, let's say, 1,000. So let's assume that the current amount is, let's say, $1,000. A recoverable amount, recoverable amount is let's say thousand two hundred. That is right No impairment. We don't have what impairment gain. We only have impairment loss. So therefore, these assets have not suffered any impairment. That means you can recover what you can recover more than the current value. So in actual fact, probably you can, you can call it impairment gain, but we don't have impairment gain, either impairment loss or no impairment. So take note. Now let's take these items and then look at them one after the other. Now impairment, we should know the difference before I go to this item. We should know the difference between impairment and depreciation. Different between impairment and depreciation. Very important. Now, even though impairment and depreciation in a way have a similar treatment, but they are not the same, two different things altogether. So let's say depreciation. Let's say impairment. Now, first, when you talk about depreciation, that one is a systematic allocation. You know that once you have an asset, by all means, definitely the value reduced. Perfect. That one, no argument. So the decision is what? Deliberate. However, impairment. Impairment is something must trigger. Something should happen before impairment will occur. So let me give you a scenario. In the morning, probably you pick something from the fridge and you forgot to probably put it back and then rush to the office. You are in the office and then you remember that you mm, didn't place the item that you picked from the fridge. So what happened is this. Now quickly, you suspect that by the time you get back home or return to the office, uh, you won't get the actual taste of that item because it might probably get spoiled. So that is impairment. So impairment is something need to cause that. Impairment is not that like, it's not that like a deliberate action. No. There must be indication. So take note of that. Okay. 
Now, impairment have steps. So let's look at the steps of impairment. And then there must be indication. But the first step starts with indication of impairment. Yeah. So let's look at the steps in impairment. Steps in impairment. So, step, so now we know the difference between impairment and depreciation. Depreciation is the deliberate action. Impairment is no. Impairment is not deliberate. Impairment is like something needs to trigger before impairment will occur. Depreciation, once you have the asset with you, by all means, it will depreciate. By impairment, you can prevent impairment. Yes, you can prevent impairment. Good. So, by depreciation, no. No, 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 no. The third examiner, impair, because impairment is not a deliberate action, there need to be some steps to test for it. We we'll test for impairment. So steps in what? Testing for impairment. So steps in testing for impairment. Third examiner that impairment is not a deliberate action. So you need to test for it. So something that is fixed that, oh, the value must drop, no, unless you test them. So how do you test for impairment? The very first steps, there must be an indication. So step one, look for indication, so or indicators. So we indication, indication, good. That's the first thing that we have to look at for indication or indicators. So step one, is it indicators now before impairment probably will occur uh, there must be an indication something triggering to the impairment something causing the impairment something causing the fall in value good so the indicators let's look at the indicators of what impairment or source of information for impairment how do you know that this asset you will not get the actual value. Okay. Impairment simple means this particular asset that I am putting, if I should, I will not be able to recover the actual value today. That means this asset has been impaired. Now, before I will think of, I may not be able to recover this amount. Something to happen to this asset before I begin it good. Now, there must be conditions or circumstances or information that will suggest to me that this asset i might not be able to recover the value what are the information and what are the how do you call it the indication so now let's quickly look at the indications of impairments indications of impairments now we have external indication and then the internal internal indication so let's look at the internal first, then look at for the external. So indicators are number one, let's look at the internal. So internal indication, so internal. Some information within the company suggests that these assets Suffered what impairment information within. So internal indicators are number one, physical damage of the assets. Physical or damage. Physical damage to the assets or obsolescence. Physical damage or obsolescence. Physical or evidence of physical damage of an asset can cause impairment or lead to impairment. So let I realize that you have a device and now like if your um, cell phone or smartphone, for instance, just hold it like this and gently lower it and leave it, and let it fall onto the ground. Now you feel like mm, you're about to lose something. Look at how you feel. 
Yes, it suggests that the phone, you might not get the actual value of the phone. So the phone might be what be impaired. So physical damage goes. So physical damage cause an impairment. For instance, if your phone physically get damage or by cracking, if you should sell this phone today, you might not be able to get the actual value. That is what we are talking about. There's an indication. This one's an indication. It does not suggest that it's impairment. Take note, there's an indication. Good. So that is that. Now, the next one I'll talk about is the change in the use of the assets. Change in the use of the assets. So change in the use of the assets and the use in the use of the asset. This one is very common. Use of the asset is very common. Extremely common because you've done some before. Let me give you a physical example. You know, some companies are individuals, if you get new items you showcase it right anytime you buy something new new vehicle new house new job hobby new man new wife new husband you showcase them off good why is it that when they become old you hide it from your friends and that means it's suggest there's an impairment so anytime you realize that someone is changing the use of an item Moving from a very good place to a very bad place, that is the use. Let me give you a business example. You know, when companies acquire assets, let us know you have head office. This company, anytime they buy brand new cars, it will be used at the head office. When these cars are getting old, then they now push it to the branch or the rural communities. Why they change the use of the assets? It suggests that the asset has been impaired because if they use this asset at the head office, they will not get the actual value. But when they send it to the village, they might get the value there. So at the city, they might not get the value. Have you seen these um, bus drivers? Yes, transport owners. When they buy new buses and new vehicles, it will probably run for a long journey. Yes, long distance. But when these vehicles become old and older, they probably change the use and then now either it will not carry goods or go for a short distance or a short journey. That is an indication. Good. So that is that. Please, it does not mean that if you see a very brand new vehicle at the village, that vehicle has been impaired. No. If you don't have money to buy brand new vehicle to the village and somebody has the money, what's the issue? We are saying there's an indication. It does not suggest that all brand new cars that you see in the village that has been impaired. No. So take notes. But anytime you change the use of the assets, there's an indication that assets may have been impaired. And then uh, the change of the use could be also like um, as a result of ideal capacity or restructuring. You know, if the organization is going through some restructuring, like COVID period, most organizations are restructuring. Some of the assets become idle, right? Some of the vehicles are idle because the operators are no longer available. So what do we do? Now let's change the use. Let's send it, let's move it from this factory to the next factory where probably we still have some people there to use this machine. That is the cause of the change in the use of the assets. Basically, that is that. These ones are indications. So first, there must be indication. Okay. Now the physical damage, it could be accident. I will tell it, it could be accident. Physical damage could be what accidents, 
and then go back. Now let's look at the Now, anytime you suspect that um, there could be worse economic um, performance or worse performance of the assets, like internal reports suggest that the economic performance of the asset will be worse than expected. So expected worse economic performance. So expected what? was economic performance of the asset. So anytime you suspect that this asset may not give you the true value, then there's an indication that that asset may have been what impaired. So what do you do? The test for impairment. How do you test for impairment? The first step is to now look at the indication, the source of information that may be available. These are the internal indicators. These are the internal indicators. And let's go to the external indicators. Good. Okay, let's look at some few external indicators. External indicators. Uh, external indicators. I'll talk about number one, passage of time. Passage of time or of useful life, let's put this way, useful life of the assets. You know, for us and when the asset is coming older, the actual value that we can probably drive drops. And now when we cannot control the issue level of the asset, probably, so that may be caused an impairment on us, or that suggests that the asset may have been impaired. You know, the asset normally at their youthful stage or the early stage, they produce more than getting to the uh, uh, end stage where the asset is very weak, the production is quite low, below expected amount. And as a result of that, probably influence or the benefit is quite low. So indication of impairment, that is that. Now we can also talk about the market interest rate or the market rate of return on investments have increased during the period. Good. And then this increase is likely to affect the risk and reduce to calculate the asset value. So you tell the government that increase in what market interest rate could also suggest. So number two, increased. And market interest rate. So if the interest rate increases, that means that this one factor that we use to calculate the asset value also increase. And in the increase in cost of capital reduces what the value. The higher the cost of the capital, the lower the value obtained. And in the lower the value, that is, it suggests that there's an impairment because if we have something that we, we can recover low value, then there's an indication of what impairment. Good. And then decrease in international size for that market. So the market price of the assets probably declined significantly. So significant kind of market price of the assets. So market price of the asset decrease. So market price of the asset decrease over the period. So you have an asset and then uh, the market price probably drop significantly. It will definitely affect the yield of the asset. For instance, look at the oil market. When COVID started, the price of the oil or the crude oil dropped significantly. So all assets that are within that area, in fact, they had a huge impairment. That is external indication, external indicator. Or sometimes with the underlying assets, the value of the underlying assets could be obtained from another base. If this base change adversely, it will probably affect some of the underlying assets. 
So these are indications. So step to the test for impairment. First, make sure that there's an indication and we've gone to the indications, external and internal. Accident could be one, accident. Accident is a clear indication of what? Impairment, damage through accident. The car or the vehicle involved in accident, it suggests that you might not get the actual value. That is why most of the accident vehicles are very cheap as compared to accident free vehicles. Yeah. It does not suggest that probably all asset vehicles are cheap. No, it depends on the magnitude of the damage. So we can still have accident car, which is so expensive than probably accident free cars. So take note that these are indicators. Something that indicates that, oh, like the symptoms of COVID-19. If you have those symptoms stated, it does not mean that you have the COVID unless that you tested or unless you tested positive. You can see show all these symptoms and the test you have negative. You tested negative, even though there's an indication that you may have COVID, there's no COVID in your system. So the same thing applies to impairment here. Even though there's indication here, until you test it and prove that yes, indeed, there's an impairment, you cannot say that there's an impairment. Take note of this. Okay, now let's move on to the next step. Now, right after the step one, where you, there's a clear indication, there's a clear symptoms that mm, it's a sign of COVID, then you move forward to the, to the testing center so that they will probably test you. Because if you go don't show symptoms, they will not test you. Good. Step number two, after the indication or the symptoms of impairment, we now determine the following values. So, determine A, the current amount of the assets. We have to determine the current amount of the assets, in which probably we do have them already in our books. So, the current value of the assets is still really issue. We have it in our books. So let's pick it up. B. Now it estimates the recoverable amount. Estimates that is that you do what? Estimate. Estimate the recoverable amount. That is where the issue is. Recoverable amount. Now let's take time and then go through how we can obtain the recoverable amount. Estimate the recoverable amount. Recoverable amount. So that's the second stage. That's the second stage. So I'm going to take time probably to go through this recoverable amount, how we can obtain recoverable amount. Now, when you mention recoverable amount, as the name suggests, recoverable. So for instance, this particular asset that I'm holding, the recoverable amount simple means the amount I can recover through use or through sale of this asset, that is all. So let's go. So recoverable amount, continuation from here. We are continuing from that angle. Okay, so let's look at the recoverable amount, how we can explain the word recoverable amount. Because at the second stage of the impairment test, we need to estimate the recoverable amount. When you mention recoverable amount, what are we talking about? Third example that it is the amount that we can recover through what? So the amount that we can recover. So amount to be recovered. Recovered through. Through one, sale of the asset, sale of the asset. When you sell the asset, when you sell the asset. Two, when you use the asset, use through sale of the asset or use of 
the asset. What I have here, sorry, it's not that clear. Let me now. So anytime we ask us to probably uh, define recoverable amount, tell examiner that so it's just an amount to be recovered through sale of the asset or use of the assets. So in short, let's go to the formula for finding recoverable amount. This is the definition of recoverable amount. So that any asset with you, if I should use this asset, what is the value? Put it at one side. If I should sell this asset today, what is the value? One side. Then you sell it what? Mm -hmm. So it is an amount to be recovered through sale of an asset or, or use of the asset. So let's go to the formula. In short, so from the above definition, recoverable amount, tell the examiner that from the above definition, recoverable amount is the higher, you compare two items and select the highest one, is the higher of these two. That is all. So just select the higher of these two values. This is called fair value, less cost to sell. Fair value, less what cost to sell. If you sell the asset, use of the asset, we call it value in use. Value in use. So take note. So here, higher of fair value, less cost to sell. Compare that very one to value in use. Value in what use. So that is the stage two of the impairment test. After the indication, can we assess and then know and estimate the recoverable amount? These figures are estimates. They are not actual figures. Take note, they are not actual figures. Good. So that is it. So we have to go into it and then let learn more. Now I think I'll start with the fair value cost to sell. We can also call it NRV, net realizable value. Now we look at it under the inventory, the NRV of the assets. If I should sell this asset right now, how, what will be the amount probably we are going to obtain. So to be expected selling price, less selling cost, that is all. So selling price, so much less was cost to sell the asset. So when I less up off, I get what the NRV or the fair value less cost to sell. So the formula state that recoverable amount is the higher of fair value less cost to sell versus value use. Now we know fair value less cost to sell to be what NRV or the amount, the net amount we can or we are expected expecting from the sale of the asset. Let's go to value use. The value use is called entity specific value. Entity specific value. So take note. So entity specific value. So that is that entity specific value. That I'm learning for it. Now value use simple means. The value that the entity will obtain when they use this asset, when they use it in the production of goods and services. So it's nothing by the present value that is done. It's a present value of all future cash flows. That is all. Present value of all future cash flows from the use of the asset. That is all. Please and please again, it includes the scrap value. That is all. It includes what the value. So now we know how to assess this. Okay. So basically, um, that is that. Basically, basically, that is that. Now let's continue the game. Now let's go to the step three and the impairment is of recognition of impairment. So step three is the recognition of impairment. 
let's go to step three, recognition of impairment. Now we get a step two very well. For carrying amount, I didn't go into detail because for carrying amount, we know how to calculate carrying amount under IS 16 is the cost less what accumulated depreciation. It is a recoverable amount that is new to us and we have to go into detail and look at for how we can determine the recoverable amount. How you get that? Let's continue the game to the step three. Just that we will look at impairment of intangible assets. Now, for intangible assets without a definite life, for that one, take notes as we look at it. Uh, for that one, whether there is indication or there's no indication, indicator, no indicator, we test for impairment annually. So, so take note of that one. Intangible asset without a definite life such intangible asset, whether there's an indication or not, impairment need to be tested. That is all. Unlike those that would useful life, that one there must be indication before we test some impairment. So the step three of impairment is what recognition of impairment. Recognition. So at what point do you record asset? Sorry, do you record impairment? That's the step three. Recognition and the measurement of impairment. Recognition. Now, third phenomena that impairment need to be recognized if and only if the current amount is still the recoverable amount. The third phenomena that impairment needs to be recognized. If and only if and only if conditional technology, even only if the current amount exceed what if the current amount exceed the the recoverable amounts, take a lot of this. Finally, Alan. so here in summary, impairment needs to be recognized if the current amount is the recoverable amount. At a step two there, at a step two. So that is all, at a step two. We are done. Left the accounting treatment of impairment. The way we treat impairment, the same thing as the Revaluation. So, revaluation loss. How we treat revaluation loss under IA 16 basically the same as how we are going to treat impairment loss. All of them come with both loss. And so, take note of that. And there are three types of assets they are going to look at for. There are three types of assets they are going to look at for. Three types of what assets. How to treat impairment loss. The following assets. How to treat the impairment of the following assets. So let's see. Accounting treatment of impairment. So that we now know that we are done with impairments. Then we start solving questions. Accounting treatment of impairment. First, impairment. It's a loss. So, uh, it should be written off to the PNL. So, add it to operating expenses. So, debit it to your PNL or just add it to your admin expenses or, or your cost of savings, depending on the company's policy. There's an exception here, except for if there's what? Previous game, except for, except for if there is a previous game, maybe revaluation game, 
like I said, impairment treatment is the same as what revaluation loss. So take note of that. And then treatment number two credits the assets, credit what? The current amount of the asset, meaning that it's subtracted from the current amount of the asset. This one does not have any exception. And this, you can get it from 2017 November ICAD. I see question number two, two C there, good. Question two C, that is the question on board. We we'll look at our question today and move on. Now let's quickly look at the last aspect and I will now zoom into a few examples. Then we move on with the impairment. Okay, let's do something here. I can probably. Okay, now let's look at some things. If you are learning all impairment, all impairment questions will be on the following assets. So take note. We have what you call individual assets. Asset that need to be impaired. Assets that we are going to impair them. Number one, I want to impair them. Number one is individual assets. Individual assets. It means that assets that produce cash flow on their own. Assets that produce cash flow on their own. I produce cash flow on its own. Asset number two, we have what you call cash generating units. Cash generating unit, right? This one is a unit which made up of a lot of individual assets that generate cash together. How do you get it? Cash generating unit. This is not a single asset, no. This is not a single asset. It is just a unit. So let's take something like a bus. Let's take example, a bus. Number one, bus driver. The bus itself, comma, the driver. And the conductor, conductor. All the three people have to come together before they can probably produce cash flow. The bus alone cannot produce the cash flow because it needs to be controlled. Even if it's a driverless bus, we need probably control from the office. So still there's a driver in the office. There's a driver that's not in the bus. Good. And then there must be a conductor, someone taking the money. Yes. Someone receiving the cash flow because the driver cannot stop the vehicle and then receiving the cash flow. Now this is not these three people, the asset of the company, but um, they come together to produce cash flow. That is it. So let's assume that we have some of the assets they don't produce cash flow on their own. They join together before they produce the cash flow. How do you impair them? There's a, a critical way to impair them. Finally, impairment of goodwill and other assets. Impairment of what? Goodwill. You know, impairment of goodwill. Good. I might not be able to treat this critical in today's section. Why? Because it's probably an consolidation, so I'll do that an consolidation. So follow us up to consolidation. I'll look at it and the consolidation has in pair good role. And so, so in today's section, just relax comfortably and look at for now. You're going to look out for implement of individual assets, then. I'll solve one or two questions and come to what you call cash generating unit. That is all. And you are fine. So let's start our question solving. Our question solving. A few illustrations. I'll pick one or two of them. Then we move on quickly. And pet the question solving on 
English VG. So that is that. Now let's go to the critical questions. I'll saw a few of them and move on and then meet again to continue and finish all the questions. All the questions. All the questions. Let's look at this question. It's called Gosu Timbers. Gosu Timbers. So Gosu Timbers, let's look at the requirement. Calculate the recoverable amount of the plant and impairment loss, if any. So this is a um, 2012 um, part four. That was the final uh, reporting question, question one. Let's look something in here. It reads like this. Gosling Timbers Limited produces and exports lumber and plants. It owns it owns a number, sorry, owns a plant which ha has a book value of 1.8 million series. Book value means current amount. So this examiner is very good. You are not going to calculate any current amount. Some of the questions you have to calculate the current amount yourself. You have to calculate the current amount yourself. Good. So take notes and how to calculate the current amount. It is not a big deal. Get a cost, get a noted depreciation, take it off, and get a current amount up to the date of the impairment test. Yeah, the impairment test was on 1st January 2011. 1st January 2011. So tell, tell us that. We need to get a current amount as of that date, and they've been giving it to us. Thank God. The government of Ghana passed a legislation that's the exportation of lumber. Good. What happened is this um, if there's a restriction in the use, we learned that anytime there's a restriction in the use of the assets or change in the use of the assets, so that means gold sitting bears have to change the use of this plant. They can no longer use this plant to produce lumbers for export because there's a restriction on export. So definitely the value will drop. Or they cannot use it up to the maximum capacity because now there's a quota. They cannot export as many as probably previous. So what happened is this. So this plant probably they need to change the use. So therefore, there's an indication of what impairment. Check all impairment questions that I said there's an indication in the question. Consequently, the company has to reduce production significantly. Where you are, cash flows forecast the next four years, including budget submitted for management approval in January 2000. Show the following cash flows that in there. The cash flow forecast 2004 as better produce for the result of plant. The cash flow projection also in the effect of the general upwards movement. Okay. And it is estimated that if the plant is sold in January 2011, it will realize a net proceed of 1.32 million. Okay. The cost of capital is 15%. Ignore. Inflationary effects. Okay. Now, uh, we need to first have the current amount there. So first, let's calculate the recoverable amount. In the recoverable amount, we have to get two values and find what the higher one. Let's estimate that of the, the value in use first. So now we'll give you the rules governing the value in use. What are the rules governing value in use? Perfect. Now we said that the value in use is estimated future cash flows. And we have to find their present value. Let's look at the rules. Rule number one make sure that you pick the cash flows one year from now. Cash flows, if you are looking for the cash flows, if we're in 1st January 2011, one year from now, we went 31st December 2011. So pick cash flows one year from now. That's the rule number one. If you are 
using the cash flow. So money that this asset will generate, lease and lease again, do not include any money already generated by this asset. No, forget about that one. Consider the money yet to be generated from one year from now. How do you get it? Good. So those ones are the ones that we need to take care of. Rule number two. Rule number two. Rule number two. And it, it has been a very trick section for most of the examiners and students. Too. The last year cash flow, the last year cash flow should include include the scrap value or the residual value. Take note that the last year cash flow, the scrap value has been added. Last year cash flow, the scrap value must be cut. If it's not in, what do you do? Can you add it to it and then you move on? So take note of that last year's cash flow should include what? The scrap value. Let's see this question if it's included. The cash flow forecast, the cash flow forecast for 2014, that's the last year. Okay, sorry, let's test the, the first rule. The first rule says that you need to pick the cash flow at the end of the year, right? Good. Now, budget for the next four years. It means that is 2011 is at the end of 2011, not January. If it is January, we are not going to include it because we want cash flows that will be a year from the date that we are testing for the impairment. We are testing for what? January 2011, exactly one year from 31st December 2011. Clear. Rule number two confirm and be satisfied that the, that the last year cash flow includes the scrap value or the residual value. And thank God the examiner said the cash flow forecast for 2014 includes the expected proceeds from the disposal of the plant. Perfect. That's a good examiner. Most of the questions that we are going to set, we are going to solve subsequently, they will not tell you that they've added it. So you have to do not add it. So take note that if they've not added the last year's, if not added the scrap value to the last year's cash flow, we need to add it by ourselves. How do you? Then that means in that situation, they must provide the scrap value to give it to you. Free of that, just add it to it. I'll be getting it. Now, once these two rules are okay, they are fine, what do you do? We now discount it. So we said that. The value you use, you need to sum these cash flows and get their present values. Sum them together, and that is all. So all the cash flows need to be summed up. Good. So let's start and solve that. So third examiner, we are looking for what you call recoverable amount. Recoverable amount. We will start from the value you use first value in use. So when you are going to calculate the value use, is the present value of the future cash flows to be created from the use of the asset. So therefore, sorry, good. So therefore, just put a year here, Get your cash flow, get your discount factor, and then the present value. And then you probably discount them. So let's write the years in here. So the cash flows are 550,000, 500,000, 300,000 a year. So let's do something here. So let me record them in. And then we move on. Now they give us 2011. Can we be year one as a 2011, or you can just make it 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014. The cash flows are in Ghanaian cities. 
So first year we have 550,000. Second year we have 500,000. And then uh, we have 300,000. We have 300,000. We have 700,000. Please and please again. This cash flow, the examiner can let you calculate from the scratch. They will give you the selling price of the unit that this plant will produce. Oh, these are the selling price. Let's say year one, year two, year three, year four. Selling price is, let's say, 25 cities, 30 cities, and go. Oh, the units, they will produce timbers of, let's say, 1,000 units, 500 units. So that means you have to multiply to get what that of the... You have to multiply to get that of the cash flows yourself. So something like this, you get 25,000 cities. That'll be the year one cash flow. Come and put it in. So when I give you the selling price of the product and the units, can you find their cash flow? But now from here, we've been given the cash flows already. Now the discount factor too, sometimes they don't not give you the discount factor. So you don't need to calculate the discount factors yourself. And the cost of capital is what 15% in here. So let's calculate the discount factor by ourselves. 15%, so right against it, 15%. So let's produce a discount factor of 15%. So first, let's try the examiner. One over one dot one five to the power one. Uh, sorry, that's how it's not coming. So the first year will be one over one dot one to the power five. Good. That's the first year. Second year will be 1 over 1.15 to the power 2, discount factor. Then third year in that order. The one I was ready, you can probably 0 0.870. 0 0.870. For the first year, 0 0.756. 756 for second year. And then the third year happened to be 658. 658. And finally, 0 0.482. 0 0.0. 0 0.5. And Okay. So that is it. Now let's look for the present value. The present value simply means the current monetary value of the I, the future cash flow. So this time this put it there as the present value. So let's go 550,000 times 0 0.870. So let's see the answer. So 550, one, two, three times 0.87. That should be 478,500. 478,500. Then let's see the next one. The next one happened to be 500, okay, 375,000. So 375,000. The next one have to be $197,400. Then finally, 700,000 times um, dot 572, $400,400, right? So 400,000, 400. Okay, so that's 400, 400, 50, 50, 40, 40. 
Okay, so basically we need to sum them up to get a value used for the company. Therefore, the value used to be value in use will be. So this becomes the total value in use or just a value in use, the total value in use that is them now. So 400, 400, so 800. So that should give us something like, that should give us something like uh, 14, that is 1451300, comma, comma. Then you, hold on, I'll be you get that. Good. Then you could bring what you call the fair value less cost to sell. Fair value less cost to sell. Why are you doing this? So that we can compare and look out for the recoverable amount. Recoverable amount is the higher of these two. Of these two. So let's go and bring the fair value less cost to sell. In this question, you were told that it is estimated that if the plant is sold in January 2011, that day it would realize a net profit of what? 1320. 1320. So that is a fair value less cost. So because it's a net proceed, that's the NRV. So one three. Two zero. So one three two zero. So now underline it like this and now determine the recoverable amount. Tell us recoverable what amount. What is the recoverable amount in here? What should be the recoverable amount? How do you determine recoverable amount? Mm -hmm. How do you determine recoverable amount and what's the recoverable amount? It's not saying that recoverable amount is the higher. So it should be 1451300. How do you get it? So 1451300. Top one line is please and please again tell us that. He selected that one because the higher, let the examiner be aware that is the higher. Because you are comparing two values. All of a sudden, you selected one. What's the basis? Yes, there is in the room. Now, if you're able to calculate the recoverable amount for the examiner, let's proceed to calculate what the impairment is loss. But can you join some few points down? I can probably go back and then view it again. Or can also uh, pause the video and then copy. Okay, now let's proceed to copy for the impairment. So now we are down the recoverable amount. So the next stage, tell the examiner that you are going to cover it for the impairment. So impairment loss, if any, to start all the current amount of the assets. Current amount of the assets. We told that it's 1.8 million. Okay. And what is the recoverable amount of the assets? recoverable amount of the asset. We've calculated our one also to be 1.451300. So therefore, impairment to be impairment will be what is the impairment? Impairment. 
what is the implement here. Three hundred and forty-eight thousand seven hundred. So three hundred and forty-eight thousand seven hundred. What is the accounting treatment of this impairment? What is the accounting treatment? Even though it was not asked, let's probably don't add it to it in the exams by here. I'm adding it to it. A, B, third examiner. That debit your PL this figure 348700. To be specific, that examiner, it will go to admin or cost of sales, depending on the company's policy. Sorry, that bit wasn't coming. Uh -huh. So that admin or cost of sales, depending on the company's policy. Second, that examiner that you have to credit the asset carrying amount. Carrying amount of the asset needs to be what credited. It means that credited by three, four, eight, seven hundred. So meaning that the asset needs to be written down to a recoverable amount. If you subtract to get a recoverable amount, you have thousand eight or one point eight million there, less three, four, eight, seven hundred. To show give you the recoverable amount one four five one three hundred. Okay, that suggests that right after impairment, the asset value should not fall below its recoverable amount or above its recoverable amount. Probably. Okay, so that is that. Let's move on. Now I need to solve one um, dangerous question. I'll look at it. Uh, no, it's not dangerous. Like it's just a nice and tricky question. It's about the rivers, which came in November 2017. Question number two there. So let's look at that particular question. So let's quickly look at this particular question. I'll just come through for you to look at it. And the next meeting, we will probably solve it in detail. Solve it in detail. So, in accordance with ISS impairments of assets, recommend with weapons how the above transaction should be accounted for as at the fact, sorry, as of fact, in between 2017. It will Ariga Limited, Ariga Limited acquired its head office on January 3, 2007, at a cost of 10 million. Excluding the land, the company debuted, the company's debitation policy is to debit property over 50 years on straight line basis. Estimated receipt of our reserve, the debitation for each year is worth 10 million over 50. That will probably give us something like 10 million over 50. It should give us something like 105. That's over 2 million. two million. Okay. On 31st December 2011, the imports, you count from 3rd January 2007 up to 31st December. After the third December, how many? How many years? So probably uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So uh, that's five solid years. Agreed. Good. So five years depreciation. Five years depreciation. So zero two by five, which give us one. So that means the current amount of value is worth nine million, if possible. Alga Limited revalued the non-land element of its head office to sixteen million. Now, according to highest in property land and equipment, the company had decided to transfer the annual amount, the annual amount out of the revaluation reserve. And assets as assets are used. In January 2017, storm damage, storm damage occurred 
and the recoverable amount of the land, sorry, of the head of his property, excluding land, was estimated to be 5.8 million. Good, this is not very good. We have given us a recoverable amount for the treatment. Let's do that this question, okay? Let's really go to the procedure to solve this question. Let's go to the board quickly. Now, step by step approach. When you move, you move. When you stop, you stop. So, tell examiner. First of all, tell examiner that the cost of the building head office. So, let me put Ghanaian cities in thousands here. Cost of the building, they said the building element. It should be 10,000 because they said 10 million, right? So that's 10,000. Now, tell the examiner that the duration life is 50 years. So the position for a year will be, let's put the position in here, the position for a year. So we're into bracket. Or we should go straight forward and find the accumulated depreciation, right? So that we can easily finish the game. Accumulated depreciation. It will be the depreciation for a year, 10,000 divided by 50 years, times the number of years from January 2007 up to 31st December 2011. We counted, we had over 2007 part. 8, 9, 10, and 11 in itself. That's five years. So, five solid words, yes. So, probably what to be the answer if we should, we should perform this calculation. So, that would be 10,000, 1, 2, 3, divided by 50 times that's 200, right? Times five. That should be 1,000. So 1,000, so the current amount is what 9,000 as at the date of what the revaluation, the current amount of the asset at the date of what revaluation. Then there's another treatment, accounting treatment of this current amount, A and B. First treatment, this current amount debit the assets. Current amount of the assets. Debit the current amount of the asset by what? By 9,000. Uh, sorry, facts. I thought I was looking for the revaluation gain or not. Let's quickly go to the revaluation. I thought that's what we are treating. If not getting the revaluation, Gain or loss. So I said that on the 2011 first, Agar Limited revalued the non land elements of the head of his building to 16 million. 16 million is a revalued amount, right? So let's see if we look at the revaluation gain or loss. So the heading will be revaluation gain or loss. Start with the revalued amount. Revalued. Amount and the examiner said that the revalued amount is 16 million. So they say 16,000. What is the current amount at the date of valuation? And we've calculated that we had 9,000, right? So therefore, the gain would be 7,000. So that is revaluation gain of what? 7,000. Immediately, third examiner treatment. Accounting treatment of this 7,000 will be third examiner. The board and third examiner. That's the accounting treatment for this particular amount will be number one. Treatment number one. Third examiner, they must debit the assets debit the asset, asset current amount with the gain of what? 7,000, that's the first treatment. Don't forget the first treatment. That was what I was writing first, debit the asset with the gain of 1,000, 7,000. 
That's the first treatment. So David has said to Rocket 7,000 cities. Now it should be 7,000 million. So let's take note of that. So it should be 7 million. B. Credit what you call OCI or the revaluation surplus or capital surplus with what? 7 million. 7 million cities. That is all. We are now with a fair show. If you're able to do this, at least you score yourself up to three marks. If you're able to do this, you have to score yourself up to three solid marks. Let's go and do the heartbeat. And then we can jump. Let's quickly go and then look at the heartbeat. Now let's go to the next page. Now this is something in here. In January 2017, some damage occurred and the recoverable amount of the head office, excluding the land of estimated to be 5.8 million. Now pause before you get it. It's mentioned in date. Now in financial reporting, be very sensitive to date. Sensitive to date and very sensitive to these um, full stops and words, comments, those words. But this is the most important one. So January 2017, so can you find a current amount for me? Calculate the current amount of this property as at that date. Good, so let's go and calculate the current amount as at January 2017. First thing that we have to do, how do you get that figure? Now, after valuation, the asset value becomes what the revalued amount. So now this asset right value 16,000. After valuation, the asset value becomes what the revalued amount. That's 16,000. So that means we need to find the current amount on the 16,000 as that what 2017. Meanwhile, this asset was acquired for how many years? 50 years. And as that this day, or as that the date of valuation, if you for how many years? Five years, right? Five years is gone. So let me know how many years? 45 years, right? Perfect. So let's go and find a current amount of these assets. So look at how I'm going to do that. Very interesting. So first, go on top like this. Tell the examiner that we are going to look for the current amount of the asset as at the date of the impairment test. And that date is what? 3rd January 2017. Tell the examiner the current amount of the asset. Sorry. Current amount. Of the asset as at what first January 2017. An examiner. Now the real value amount will be what? It's 16,000 agreed. Still carry your three levels on top. Get the what you call accumulated depreciation. We call it subsequent accumulated depreciation. So subsequent, which is in what IA sixteen revaluation model. To find the current amount and the revaluation model, is the revalued amount less what you call subsequent accumulated depreciation. So subsequent accumulated depreciation. Accumulated depreciation. So accumulated depreciation. Open a bracket. Tell them that this 16,000 will now be divided by what 45 years. Why 45 years? Right after the valuation, that's a like reduced to what 45, but out of the 50 years, five years is gone. Now times calculate the number of years from the date of valuation. That is 31st, 31st December 2011. 
up to 1st January 2017, please, how many years? Someone should tell me this. So from uh, 31st December 2011 up to 1st of January 2017, how many years? Don't forget to count your fingers at the exam room. So let me start counting mine. So 2011 is not part. So 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. 17 to will not be bad. I like that. So the answer is what? one, two, three, four, five. So that is five solid years. Yes. 2011 is not part. 2017 is not part because it's not up to full year. So it start from 2012, 13, 14, 15, and what? 16. So basically, we have how many years? Five solid years. Good. So that is how you have to work it out. Don't face out to read reading figures like this or writing figures like this. Writing figures like this let you get a clear understanding and solve the question through free free of chat. Then to probably use oh hide behind the scene and calculating it. And I don't know the day probably it might not be the actual one. So time five years, right? Times five years. Even though we have, I think uh, when you're doing a revaluation, re gain and I system, I give her some shortcuts to calculate the current amount. You can probably use that in here. Okay, so what would be the current amount of these assets? So that should be 16,000. One, two, three. 16,000. One, two, three. Divided by 45 years. Ah, uh, times five. That's we one seven 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 seven. A lot of sevens. So ah, uh, let's quickly run it to the nearest number. Okay, let's maintain it to um two thousand places. So one seven seven thousand seven 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 dot seven eight. Yes, seven are plenty. Yeah, yeah. What is the current amount of these assets? The current amount of these assets. Current amount of these assets. So current amount becomes what? Current amount becomes fourteen thousand two 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 two. Wow. 14,222.22. I like the how it you are. That is me. Okay, so if this is the current amount at the date of impairment tax, we can continue the game by telling the examiner that less what recoverable amount that should give us the impairment. So let's go to this question and pick the impairment in here. And pick the impairment. The impairment in here, um, sorry, the recovery amount is 5.8 million. So 5,800. So what is the impairment here? Or no impairment. So therefore, impairment for now, we have impairment of uh 14 less 7800 that should give us something like so 8000 right so 8000 8,422 to, but it should be 2.22. Okay. Now, tell us the accounting treatment. 
this the examiner was testing what you call reversal. Like um, you are talking about exception to the general rule, but will not reverse all impairment. Exception to what the general rule. You know, impairment loss and revaluation loss have the same treatment, no difference. So take note. Now, in 2017, January, you've made an impairment loss of 8,422. Fine. But some five years ago, you had a revaluation gain of seven million sitting in your books. So now we are saying that you cannot lie to yourself that you've made a total impairment loss of what, eight million because last five years you had a gain. So at least net them off and get a final answer or the, or the difference. So it's the difference that will determine whether you. You have impaired or whether it's end. So that's all. So tell wherever the previous gain is, a portion of this loss should be released to offset the previous gain. And thank God the previous gain is sitting nicely in where? In the OCI or the revaluation surplus or the capital surplus. So it's now you have to go there and do what? Dab it. Because this is a loss. If there's no previous gain, the entire loss goes to the PL. But because there's a previous gain, wherever that gain has been recorded, let this loss go there to them fighting where well, well. So, and thank God, no clean the board, the gain is sitting in OCI. So let 7,000 of this place to the OCI. And that is all good. So, in short, the treatment goes like this. First of all, note 1A, debit OCI or your revaluation reserve by what? 7 million. Tell the examiner to reverse the previous gain. Then B, this is a treatment 1A, the 1B, tell the examiner the remainder of the impairment can now hit the PNL. The remainder of the impairment now can go to the PNL. So now let me do 1422.22. That one goes to the PNL. So now debit to the PNL as an expense. So debit to PNL, the figure will be worth million of 1.422 million. Goes to the PNL. Then let's go to treatment number two. These are the debit side. All the debit side must correspond to the credit side. So, therefore, treatment number two, you credit the assets account or the asset was carrying amount. We are now discussing asset carrying amount. Yeah. Okay, so basically, this is how we treat impairment in our books. So you can take note of this treatment. On our note, we are done with impairment of individual assets. Impairment of individual assets. How we impair individual assets. Take note of that. Unfortunately for us, this is how far we will probably end the first show. What level is impairment of cash generating unit. So in our next meeting, our next video, we will look at for impairment of our cash generating unit. Kindly subscribe to the page. If I'm not done that, support us by subscribing and then um, sharing the video, the links with your friends. And then, to go be fair. A target professional comfort is a young firm and need a lot of hand, a lot of support to go it up. You can only do that when you bless. Okay. I'll see you when I see you again in the next word lecture.
Have a nice day.